Good morning, everyone. So um, this panel topic is uh, very close to my heart. Uh, so uh, you know, for the following reason that at some point of time in future, I, I, I want to actually build a product where we can get companies to share really private data with each other, sometimes even competing companies to share private data with each other, and collaboratively fight against financial crime. Right? So I, I, I've worked in the financial crime industry for like a, a long time now. And often I see that third party companies, which are data providers, they're able to actually collaborate with uh, companies to get their data and sell it back to them. But companies themselves, they're never able to collaborate with each other. So therefore, you know, hopefully I can get some answers which will help me, and hopefully you guys can get some answers which uh, help you as well. So at this point, I'd like love to have all the panelists introduce themselves. Starting with you, Praneet. Hey, I'm and Praneet. actually, sorry, one, one also uh, quick request. While you introduce yourself, if you could also uh, just uh, tell us how did you get into the field of either machine learning or privacy. Yeah. Hey, I'm Praneet Vipakum. I'm a student and a researcher at MIT. Um, I've been a statistician from times when the data science buzzword was not as popular as it is today, nor, is the, nor was the data engineering buzzword. Um, I moved into machine learning due to working in a startup that was founded by uh, Tony Jabara, a professor at uh, Columbia and a director of machine learning. Um, so uh, so those, those are the, the beginnings, but um, currently, as far as privacy goes, um, it's, it's, it's what I really care about from a privacy-aware AI perspective and ML perspective as part of my, uh, my thesis, my research work, my domain, my bucket of problems that I work in. Um, that's all focused on distributed AI, distributed ML, and that comes along with privacy and also adjacent problems like fairness, um, security, safety, and uh, efficiency of, uh, of the algorithms from a communication bandwidth perspective <coughs> and the computational efficiency in general. My name's Abe Gong. Um, I have always loved human scale data and uh, so I came into tech, got pulled pretty quickly into healthcare. Mm -hmm. So I've worked at a company called Massive Health, little company. We got acquired by Jawbone, uh, had the fun experience of working on consumer wearables in the very early days there. So health and wellness data, very personal, just trying to figure out what that could do. Um, I've also worked more deeply in the bowels of you know, real healthcare. Uh, I was the chief data officer at a company called Aspire Health that did um, palliative care for really sick patients in their home. Uh, so I was doing data aggregation, machine learning, uh, interesting problems there, both, both on the patient facing side and on the technical side. Uh, just in general, I, I care a lot about uh, data ethics and what it means for human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm yeah, interested in talking about how sharing data, aggregating data, privacy, changes how people work together, changes power relationships, changes collaboration. Mm -hmm. yep. I'm Arun Krishnaswamy, and uh, I work at uh, Workday as a lead data scientist. And so I've been a machine learning guy throughout my career. I don't know anything else, actually, other than that. But uh, um, uh, my assumed at privacy was in a previous startup before Workday, uh, where we are trying to do very cool things like uh, you know, track, a track a shopper when they come into the store, and then combine the physical and uh, digital footprint of the shopper, put them together, so you can already imagine all the privacy issues there. So that's my stint there. And I learned a lot about uh, not just uh, how do you do data science and stuff, when you have so many constraints of you know privacy and things like that, so. Um, hi everyone, I'm Rupa. <clears throat> As opposed to all the data engineers here, I've been in security and privacy space for several years now. How I got into this space uh, was pretty simple. I was uh, came in to do, to do my masters, for instance, uh, a long, long time ago uh, in the area of dependable distributed systems, and then the, my uh, PhD. Um, thesis advisor had a, uh, a project sponsor um, recommending a, that from the Air Force Research Labs rec, rec, uh, with a proposal for uh, research on uh, privacy preserving data mining. And then the, I just searched on the internet, it just looked like something interesting. And the first paper that came up was Latanya Sweeney's paper and how she uh, was able to reconstitute 82% 80 if I'm not mistaken of Massachusetts population which is public data. And that kind of got me interested and excited enough to finish a PhD in privacy preserving data mining techniques. And then, and then I was, since then, I've been in the space of security, privacy, happy that GDPR is 
put together a term of data protection that encapsul encapsulates security and privacy together. But uh, but I've been but I've, a lot of my work through the years over the different companies that I've worked with has ha had to do a lot with uh, data. How do you handle data sharing across different domains? Like, when I was at Microsoft, it was about like uh, Bing sharing data with Office, so it becomes. Uh, what's private, what's not, what's sensitive, what's not, how do you track Cortana, I mean, location tracking, and so on. So uh, it's been an interesting space and an interesting journey. Happy that there's a lot more attention and happy that SPAN, the data council has introduced privacy and security. So excited to be here. Cool. So as you can see, we have uh, a lot of incredible talent uh, in the room at the moment. So uh, as we proceed with the questions, I would love for people to think about other questions you may have that you want to ask later, we'll reserve like five minutes towards the end for those questions. So I'll, I'd love to actually, you know, just start digging in. So uh, yeah, like one of the, the key issues that we face is that privacy and data science actually often they don't go together, right? So if you try to anonymize data, you can't extract value out of it. And quite often we've also seen cases where, you know, uh, uh, any data set which has been published uh, to Kaggle or what have you, like even the Netflix data set, people have been able to de-anonymize it, right? So what are some of the approaches that you guys are seeing either in academia or industry which will help solve that problem? So maybe we start with you, Praneet. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, with increasing levels of complexity um, beyond anonymization, because anonymization is for the lazy or people who don't mm -hmm. care about it, because uh, it's too dangerous to release a uh, public anonymized data, like he already put it. Mm -hmm. uh, so ignoring that, the next level would be obfuscation. So adding noise and kind of having noisy data mm -hmm. um, to the extent that it's preserving the privacy, uh, especially of the outlier cases. So this is basically differential privacy. And that's a ton of work done by, uh, Cynthia, originated by Cynthia Dwork, and she won a Turing, uh, Turing Award for that. Um, so that's an active area, and, uh, but the problem there is uh, Depending on how many queries or how many operations you do, you need to keep adding more and more uh, noise. So you're, there is a dichotomy between privacy and utility. Like they're kind of tightly linked. You can add too much noise, it's still private, but it's not useful anymore. Um, but it's a very fast moving area. Um, um, and then the next approach in terms of complexity, um, by complexity I mean in terms of how secure or protection, uh, how much sec protection you get uh, would be federated learning. Uh, that came up by Google AI, which was ahead of its time when it came up, but no one cared about it. But now everyone, uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of really viral in a sense within the distributed ML community. Um, and, and then split learning, which is work from our group, um, which, is, uh, which is kind of uh, doing what Federated aimed to do, which is not share raw data at all. The raw data does not leave the, any of the client. It's just the model uh, related information that is shared. Um, but split learning is extremely drastically communication efficient in terms of how much bandwidth you use. And, uh, in terms of compute and memory uh, load in the client, so it can really be rolled down even down to the IoT devices and f mobile phones where you don't expect to run a ResNet 100 because you don't have a GPU on a cell phone, uh, things like that. Um, uh, so that's that. And then there's the extreme level of security, which is uh, from the cryptographic and uh, theoretical computer science community, which is a, a, a homomorphic encryption. So. <laughs> Um, so in, in a single line, people uh, convert the data into ciphers, just like the encryption community does. Uh, but the homomorphic encryption creates the ciphers in such a way that there's a parallel operation uh, that you could run uh, on the cipher data. So if I want to do an addition of my raw data, I convert my raw data into ciphers, I send it out, it's encrypted form, um, and then there's a very extremely weird and a strange operation that is in parallel to what an addition is supposed to mean in the cipher space. So you apply that operation, and what results out is another cipher, and you send that back to the client that, restrict, uh, that requested the service, and then when you decrypt it, um, you, you end up getting the right answer of what the addition is supposed to be. Uh, same thing with multiplications and all the different circuits that are involved in uh, doing like training of deep learning models. But the biggest issue with uh, homomorphic is it doesn't scale to large, a large number of computations at all. Um, at the most, you can run, uh, it's a fast moving area, but at the most currently you can run super simple neural networks uh, with very few layers and super small data sets, but only for inference, only for prediction. You cannot train with that. Um, so what I really care about is the split learning approach, which allows you to train, uh, so does federated, um, nor, uh, nor, which, which is not done by like the obfuscation or like the homomorphic approaches. Uh, all you could do is either basic statistics or histograms and count queries and uh, um, maybe at the most uh, prediction or inference tasks, but not like a training of a model, which requires millions of compute operations. Got it. So just to uh, summarize then, would you say that homomorphic encryption uh, or 
homomorphic computation would be useful like 10 years from now, or would that be like it's even like very, 50 -ish years from now? <laughs> it's yeah. a very fast moving yeah. area. The problem, yeah. is, it's not a problem. The, the, air, the community is in some sense segregated. The community that does homomorphic encryption is extremely motivated mathematically and mm -hmm. theoretically. Um, so um, the strengths that they're putting in is leading to results which are extremely secure to even attacks like quantum computing attacks and stuff like that. Um, the mm -hmm. ML community is catching up. Um, so ML is not number one in everything. There's different communities, right? So ML is catching up to bringing in security from homomorphic. So mm -hmm. there are people that are working to abridge this space, and it's fastly moving. Um, you never know. Um, may, may, maybe not 10 years, maybe five years, you'll start training mm -hmm. mod models that are having these additional tricks that are coming up because of the abridgment that you're getting from the practical and the theoretical community. Got it. Um, so maybe... I mean, the, the roots of it is not so new. I mean, it's been around for about 10 years, if not more. Is this the interest, the ML community has been interested in, in the last what, few years, I would say, if not just a couple. Exactly. Um, so now that the ML community is interested, is, I mean, the, I've seen an exponential growth. I, mean, I wouldn't say, I mean, comparatively, to me, it seems like an exponential growth in the last two years. Um, as opposed to like in the, the previous like seven or eight years. Yeah, that's right. Another yeah. way. So maybe in the next five years we would we would see something more. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, maybe you, I want to shift focus to today. <laughs> so uh, uh, at Workday, for instance, uh, uh, Arun, you have this problem that you can't have competing companies sharing the HR data with yep. each other. Yep. So how do you solve for that problem today? Uh, wish we solved. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we are, we are trying different techniques, and uh, one of the techniques which uh, you know, uh, Praneet was talking about, the split neural network, uh, could be an option. We are exploring that option uh, where we don't have to take the... So one of the issues is like the, the data for our customers is kind of locked. And we don't... Uh, it's a legal uh, thing that it's like we don't have access to that and things like that. But there are many other techniques we are using. Some of it I cannot really share because of uh, confidentiality and stuff, but we're trying uh, different techniques to solve that problem. But uh, from a technical perspective, I think one of the first things we want to try is to um, see you know, what's the best information we can get and aggregate it to a certain extent that um, you know, we can obfuscate the, uh, the customer to a great extent. So they create like cohorts so that the real um, a tenant cannot be even identified, or the customers cannot be identified, but still make uh, it's classic data science and you know, uh, segmentation and stuff is like our first thing, so that we can actually say, oh, we are not, uh, you know, I, we try to do it in such a way that uh, reverse engineering is not possible. This is something I actually learned uh, in my previous startup where uh, we were trying to stitch data for a specific shopper from multiple third-party sources, and um, we sh usually we give some kind of an identification to them, and they, they stitch the data and give it back to us. And uh, but when they do it, they basically strip off the identity and stuff. Like so, they think that they are doing a great job of, you know, uh, protecting. But we could actually reverse engineer quite easily. So largely because I know what are the techniques we use for reverse engineering, I think we want to make sure when we do the same thing at Workday, we want to just avoid those uh, things. So it's I think pretty much experimental to a great extent. Like, let's say, try different techniques, and, uh, and above all, we also have to have the legal um, implications of whether the customer would agree to what we are trying to do. I think that's a big one, too. People, t there is a technical part to it, and there's always like this legal part to it. When you work with actual customers, um, you know, what they feel about uh, sharing their data is a big hurdle to cross than the technical side. So. Yeah. yeah. Yep. One issue oh. is a cat and mouse Actually, problem. Yeah. I have a follow-up question, though, like yeah. before we dive yeah. in. So, like, the way I understand it, um, split learning is an approach where, at a very high level, you're trying to obfuscate the data itself by training a neural net, right? Uh, so Would the that data doesn't leave, uh, but yeah. you're only sh the data doesn't leave. Yeah. Um, all you're doing is. Uh, Training, uh, sh communicating partial parts of your model. So the, what needs to be learned is split. The model is split across the entities. Um, so there's a partial learning that every entity contributes to, and a very small fraction of that is communicated. Uh, so it's like highly, highly transformed data, and then there's additional tricks that we do so that you cannot reconstruct back. Got it. So 
it will be fair to say that if I were to just use a neural net and train it like in one tenant to train the data, then that would not be provably private in any case, right? Because it's, I could just throw all data at it and then basically learn uh, what comes out as an output and learn the, the structure of the data, so The issue uh, is we're data, not right? distributing. The data is distributed and siloed away. That's the, the premise, right? Yeah. So How the distribution you... part actually helps with preserving the privacy? Uh, well, the distribution is the landscape. The yeah. constraints are privacy. So the landscape is the data is distributed. That's the nature. Um, so uh, I want a hospital, one, to communicate with another hospital and train a model together to do a diagnostic of lung cancer, for example. Mm -hmm. um, everyone has their small pool of data, and that's the nature of it, and you cannot pull them together because of the regulation. So that's the landscape. Mm -hmm. The constraint is privacy and regulation incentives to not able to share because these are for profit, could be non-profit too, um, uh, and maintenance is an issue and things like that. So that's the constraints. And the solution is the split learning, the hammers of the problems are like split learning, federated, homomorphic. Got it. That so that's actually a good segue into uh, your work then, Abe. So what is your take on privacy versus data science, especially in the healthcare industry? When you say my work, I. It, it's almost not work. I, yeah. Since I think on this panel we have technical solutions really well represented, let me, let me just give voice to a bunch of the non-technical yeah. solutions that yes, are out please, there. Yeah. So contracts, right? Uh, in a B2B setting, you'll often have providers who work together and say, we're going to share data, but you're only allowed to use it for X, Y, and Z, and we're going to audit you. Um, at, when you get to audits, so audit logging, access logging, looking at who has looked at the data, who had access when, all, all of those things. It's peopleware, it's not really software. But it's how a lot of business gets done today, especially in healthcare. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Similar to what problems I already talked about. It's um, more technical problems, I think, eventually because of the uh, you know great growth and uh, different techniques and stuff like that would grow. But uh, I think the the contractual agreements and things like that, it's 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 almost impossible to find a way around to solve them. So I think the the Uber solution would be to combine. Um, like, you know, hybrid solution of like, how do you uh, tackle it in a, a legal way as well as the technical way and then put them together, to come up with solutions. I, so. I totally agree with that. I, I think there's a lot of interesting room for legal innovation that would also tie into data sharing innovation. Rupa, do you have more? Um, I think uh, uh, an interesting part about that is, um, I think you alluded to it as well, is uh, that a lot of the things that you cannot talk about in terms of what your solutions are. I think the, the lack of common standards, uh, common exactly. agreeable standards in terms of what is like privacy, I mean, what can be checked off as, okay, this data is private yeah. as of this day, mm -hmm. and this is an open standard, these are ways to do it. There's no one that goes and presents and says, hey, we've done this and this works, because there's so much of concern from the legal community, even though I, as an engineer, think this technique is awesome and something that we should probably share, the, the legal team would say, no way, I mean... We, I mean, the, 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 the EU would come behind you and they'll find something wrong, or the FTC would come behind you and they'd, they'd find something wrong. So unless we are more open and share what we're doing and propose techniques, and I think this, it's, it's, an, it's a hindrance for our community to grow. Yeah. So yeah. Agree would with one that. way to yeah. say that be that, you know, how do you convince the legal team that something is probabilistically private? Or yes. Like, <laughs> yeah. they want it black or white, right? And it's, it's yeah. more of some of the checkpoints that, yeah. uh, that Abe mentioned as well in terms of like provably, right? In terms yeah. of like, have you, do we have a way to audit this, that it's secure, but how do you know if you do not know what the other side looks like, right? Yes. How it can be used from the other side, how can an attacker use it? We do not have good models. Yeah, there are three issues. In terms of auditing, there could be adversarial attacks. It's always a cat and mouse game, mm -hmm. like you know. Um, so how do you prove for all kinds of adversarial attacks? Because the auditing community is not theoretical computer science or math, right? So they're coming up with rule-based solutions. What if I, uh, so basically simple rules that large companies follow are, I cannot query individual level data and you need specific permi permissions to be able to do that. And, and the engineers are so much, much smarter than those rules because those, those are like super simple rules from like the 80s or 60s or whatever. Uh, so the problem there is people just, Write a query that is smart that comes up with maybe 5,000 records, another query that comes up with 5,000 five records, you just differentiate it. Uh, you do a diff and then you just know what those five records that you care about are at the individual level. There's like umpteen number of solutions to do the, the breaking the auditing. Um, the problem with regulation, well, it's not a problem. The issue uh, in the regulatory space is regulation is always falling behind and catching with technology. That's the nature of regulation. Regulation changes much slowly. Technology, like people in, our, in the room that we're in, 
moves super quick. Like every day there's something that's happening. Um, so uh, the problem is um, um, we, we keep pushing the technology, but also start trying to act and synthesize and deploy, because that's when you really head face-to-face -face with regulation, head face-to-face -face with auditors and rules and what really happens on the ground truth like you were putting together, and then come up new solutions, uh, or, or, or things would not move, because this is like two orthogonal spaces of people doing their own thing. Um, that's one reason we are moving into applying split learning in partnerships between MIT and MGH, MIT and Harvard, uh, and those experiments are underway, and these are more like the synthesize and act kind of yeah. uh, situations where you come up with real so, life issues well, as well. Okay. The only thing which I want to add here is uh, <laughs> because I believe there's a more number of data scientists in this uh, room than uh, legal and other players, right? So from my experience, uh, what I've realized is that uh, it's always good to actually have the legal understanding of why a legal talks in certain ways, because it's very difficult as technologists to think um, in a very, uh, we're always trying to optimize solutions for everything, you know, that's in our head. We always go for, oh, this is the best solution I have technically, but always be cognizant on the other side on what the legal side is uh, thinking about. So if you want to be successful, preserve privacy, and actually move the things needle in terms of, you know, machine learning as well, and, um, you know, in, in these kind of situations, you always be very cognizant of the legal side. It's very, very important. You, I mean, in fact, I would go to that extent, I actually took like a course or a course to understand what my legal team was talking to. Mm -hmm. So it helped me quite a bit because, I mean, uh, they are lost uh, in my world and I'm lost in their world. Then there is nothing can happen. So it's just a you know, piece of advice from my experience that uh, try to understand their world as well to some extent. And it, uh, it's going to be very beneficial. So. Do you want to add something? Yeah, just a couple of follow-up thoughts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one, I definitely agree that regulation is slow moving. It's one of the reasons that I think working with legal at the contracting level opens up a lot of interesting possibilities because if you have companies that already want to work together ahead of regulation, right, before there's good regulation, they still have to get the legal framework in place. And so you've got people who at least have an incentive to make something happen. Um, to the point about working with legal, I've actually found working with legal to be a really interesting ethnographic experience uh, in the sense that, so as an engineer, I know that when people talk to me, they're often a little bit baffled why X is easy and X prime is really, really hard, right? I've had exactly the same experience with legal. Like, oh, if we do it this way, oh yeah, no problem. But if you do that, no, 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 that would burn the company down. And, and both are exactly the same. It, it, from an outside perspective, yeah. Exactly. But, but getting to a, pre, a place where I have a rich enough mental model of, you know, what, what are the suits and countersuits that they're worried about and what's the contracting environment they're in. Um, it, it's rewarding in the sense that, like engineering, you can sometimes find clever solutions that open up huge scapes of work. Yeah, definitely. It actually yeah. be, makes you very, uh, a very creative person. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not the technical side and then... It's like uh, you know, data science in the biological world. You know, mathematically things are possible, and then biologically they're not possible because there are constraints. Same thing happens. Uh, you know, mathematically you can solve a technically you can solve a problem, but when you add the legal stuff, you have a lot of constraints added. So, got it. So actually, this could be a good segue into the next topic I wanted to cover, which was uh, security and machine learning. Right. So I'll start off with an example. So uh, I used to work for Coinbase, a cryptocurrency company where you know, we were essentially a security first company, which meant that my data scientists could not run anything in production. They, in a lot of cases, didn't have access to data in production. So before we could even build machine learning or do machine learning on data, we had to build a super secure system where every code was actually, before it was pushed live, it had to be peer reviewed so that no one could just go run off anything, you know, haywire. And then secondly, everything had to be doubly encrypted when it was stored at rest in disk. And then in memory, you have to decrypt it so that then your machine learning models can actually decrypt the data. And now the data scientists, they didn't have access to the keys to decrypt the data, only the code that was running in our cloud environment had access to the keys, right? So we had to go through all this before we could actually do machine learning. So I'm, I'm curious to hear your, from your personal experiences, what have you seen, like uh, security and data science, you know, when they're lo at loggerheads, what are some examples you've seen? Madhura, you want to kick that off? Yeah. GDPR, uh, for instance. Sure. Yeah. Um, so there are multiple layers, like just like we have in this, uh, in this, uh, in this room here. We have the infrastructure, 
right? And data scientists need access to the raw data, right? Um, at least in part, I mean, initially to do some sampling, to build something, to prove, to, to prove some concept as much as like feature engineers. So there's, there's at some point of time you need to have trust in, in them and, um, and then get them into a sense of uh, secure environment. The first thing we had to do, I mean, as wherever I've been, is like allow for that secure environment, ensure that there is that protected environment. That's like a lot of du data duplication that we had to do uh, in terms of making that secure environment available for them and then having multiple layers on top, right? It's like building that pre-production, the research environment where they can build that's completely isolated. And then stitching up with what and, and the readiness, for instance, in terms of when, say, a model or when an algorithm is ready to, to be taken up into a production development stage, mm -hmm. right? And then that sign off is a process. And it's just what I've found is no matter how small or how big the company, we've had to create these, uh, these barriers to, to agile development just because we don't have like clear techniques like, hey, this is not built, right? This is not ingrained. I mean, if, I, if I'm starting out a company, I want to prove and keep going, right? Build, give it to, to the people, get feedback, and continue to build. Mm -hmm. and, so, uh, so there's like, there's always this access control layer first, uh -huh. and then there's like levels on top of it. And then a lot of times what we come up, uh, what we <coughs> come down to is, should we build a data warehouse, for mm -hmm. instance? And that's like a problem that um, it, some people have the have the ability and the man, uh, manpower to to build that build that out, and others do not. So you just replicate environments, and then mm -hmm. uh, and then like obfuscate, add noise, da, da 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 at every level, right? And then build up golden data sets for testing, for diagnostics. Mm -hmm. And this is not just for the machine learning sides, right? And or for the data science side. This is also for when someone has to debug an issue in production. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Do you give them? the keys to the kingdom to, to, act, uh, to access yep. the data, mm -hmm. or is, is the training set enough? I mean, th those are like problems that we have to solve for in terms of what keys they get and what processes they get. So we've built up techniques, some of which I can talk about, some of which I cannot, but there's a lot of process to involve. Got it, that's, that's good. How do you, uh, uh, Arun, solve for this at WorkDrail? Do you data scientists have access to data when <laughs> yeah, the solutions so, deploy? Uh, yeah, it's... Yeah. Uh, more than work there, I think I can. Uh, I want to give like a different example, which I faced at our previous uh, uh, stint at Visa, uh, where the problem it's like we talk about machine learning and stuff. Sometimes it becomes um, like a very interesting problem is something called an insider threat problem. Mm -hmm. um, because so you're a data scientist, you're actually working uh, in a company, and then you have to build a model to basically detect insider threat. And unfortunately, you're also an insider. So imagine this problem. It's like. Uh, so uh, if we have to develop so many uh, layers so that um, the, there is a set of people who are called security investigators who have actually know who are the people who should know who's like the, the problem guys. And uh, it could be the data scientist itself. So we have to develop so many techniques to kind of, we still need to use the data, but at the same time, uh, if, that, if that one of the insider's threat is the person who's actually the data scientist, I cannot identify myself there. So we had to use like, it's a very different kind of a problem than the you know other kind of problems you guys are talking about, where uh, you know you cannot really see the data and see and you cannot be exposed to it, but you have to build machine learning on it. So we developed um, a lot of interesting techniques. Uh, again, it became unfortunately proprietary, but I can definitely talk about it in private for you some of them, like what we used. But those are some of the. You know, it's a very interesting problem from a. Like, uh, so we had to develop stuff where we see a dashboard. We, we cannot really understand what it is. Mm -hmm. But when the security investigators see it, they know every, every story again uh, behind it. So it's kind of, um, you know, like it goes into access control and stuff, but access control in a very different way. So, so I mean, uh, at Workday also we have some similar problems, but uh, I, I think we are far, far away from solving them. But Visa is a concrete example, so I thought I could. Anyone else wants to add anything? Just a little bit yeah. of a reframing. Uh, Rupa, you said that you need trust in order to make things happen. Like my mental like rule of thumb is if you can give data scientists access to the raw data, kind of like if you can build that kind of trust, it's worth like a three to five X speed up against having to build walls in and throw things back over the walls, mm -hmm. just as a ballpark. When I think about a lot of the infrastructure you put in place for this, you can think of it as trust augmentation infrastructure. 
So for example, when you talk about uh, access logging, right? Who, who looked at which data on which times, what query did they run? Um, if you've got that in place and you have well-meaning internal actors, then it frees them to just do their thing because they know there's somebody's watching, they, they know there's an audit trail, and so they just do their thing. They don't have to worry about like what's okay to do, what's not okay to do. That's, that's a very good point, and that's, um, it's, it's just unfortunately easier said than done depending on the, oh, yeah. the stack that you use. Um, just the access control in itself. If you use a, a relational database or something like that, then that's, that's, e that's an easier problem, but otherwise it's like the layers of the stack, how do you really, I mean, you can do some level, but there's, at, at the end of the day, there is some amount of trust, but no, I, every tool needs to be built with that in mind. I, I'm totally with you. Yeah. And I, I've had this hunch that there's probably a really good startup. Maybe, maybe this already exists, yeah. but there's some probably really good startup ideas to be built around how do you scale trust within big enterprise organizations under regulation, right? And that, that have a highly technical component, but also mm -hmm. just like people process who can see what when. Mm -hmm. Cool. So actually, uh, I'll switch gears a little bit. I'll pose a technical problem that I've been thinking about for a little while. And uh, the problem is the following. So in FinCrime, as well as you know, anyone working in cybersecurity, you know, like, uh, if I want to see whether the account was created by a bot versus a human, then I would take a look at the email address and even study the, do an n-gram analysis of the email address, right? Study if it is, you know, if it matches a person's name or is it just randomly generated, right? Now, suppose, you know, I need to now encrypt email addresses before I can actually start doing any uh, such computations on it, right? For sure, I can't do SHA-256, right? You would say I can't do that, right? Well, uh, the compare operation, even after you do, like, yeah. simple things, um, will add additional computational overload. Um, but then it's also going to be open so to attacks, a, right? Like, if I just did a simple SHA-256? Uh, just doing the shot 56 is not enough. You want to do additional analysis on it because yeah. you want to do this fake, fake detection or like the detection of mm -hmm. where the, the trail of bad uh, actors are coming in. Mm -hmm. um, that is the hard part. Um, encrypting is easy. Like you can encrypt anywhere and anything. It's something goes and something comes out. Mm -hmm. But what you do with the encrypted piece is the hardest part. That's the homomorphic part. Got it. But what I was getting to was the following, which is that if I, if I were to just, uh, you know, uh, use a SHA-256, then I'm still going to be open to leakage, right? And therefore, what technique can I use such that I'm not leaking any data, but at the same time I can do n-gram analysis? Okay, so yeah. um, n-gram uh, is in a sense some sort of yeah. counting operation, but you're doing it at the pairwise, triplewise level. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of unsupervised. It's on the simpler uh, complexity of problems. So, so this can be handled. So um, what you want to do is you want to transform your email into a feature, which is often done in the machine learning community. Uh, but the feature needs to have uh, extremely low statistical dependency mm -hmm. or mutual information or correlation with the variables that you care about that you want to hide. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't want to hide the serial number for obvious reasons, but you want to hide ethnicity or... Uh, gender or things that we care about in the society or their healthcare status, um, you know, private records, the sensitive data fields. So if you can transform the email or any other input data into features which are compressed representations that are learned anyway through deep learning mechanisms and auto inquiries and stuff, um, but the thing is they don't block the flow of information that will let you reconstruct back because this is the time to do that now. Uh, all they care about is having enough information in your compressed representation or features that will let you go forward in predicting the labels, which is great uh, at uh, um, how the neural networks are doing right now. So we, we want to add this additional gate in terms of w making one-way functions, so that's one area of work, or trying to reduce the correlations, and a good measure of correlation uh, or a mutual information uh, with respect to the input data that is scalable. Um, then you have these kind of guarantees. And, uh, there is a different names for this, and one of this approach, we, we uh, uh, this is my recent paper that got accepted two days back, so I redid some of my slides in my talk yesterday. We call it no peak split anon, so no peak split anon. So it's a split learning technique where whatever you're learning mm -hmm. is extremely lowly correlated uh, in terms of what you're communicating out of one client to the other with respect to the raw data, but it has all the information to go forward to do the utility of what you want to do. Um, a nice societal application of this is uh, say I'm looking at imagery data, I want to my, say my task is to predict uh, aging symptoms of, uh, of imagery data, my facial images. 
Um, so the problem is imagery data has these other tricky sensitive variables of ethnicity, gender, blah, 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 because you want to make decisions based on this. Uh, so what we can do is convert these images into a form uh, that has extremely low information in trying to predict um, what the ethnicity or trying to classify what the gender is, regardless of what algorithm you put on it, because we've just taken that information out. It's kind of orthogonal in terms of how you converted the information, but it has all the information to go forward to do your task, which is predict age. And the reason you're doing it is because you have a job and it's legal. That's the reason the company's doing it anyway. So that's a variable you're safe with. Got it. It's so actually, uh, we are at five minute mark. And before I open up questions for the audience, start thinking about questions. I have one quick question for Abe. You know, healthcare and machine learning. So uh, in particular, I'm interested in uh, saying, you know, uh, hearing from you, how do we convince the end user, the customer, that their data is going to be dealt with securely? I have a horrible answer that, that I'm not sure I should say on stage, <laughs> um, which yeah. is, practically speaking, in US healthcare, the consumer does not really have a seat at the table right now. Their data is owned by other people. And uh, actually, the thing I'm afraid of is not that machine learning is not going to grow by leaps and bounds there. It's that it's going to grow by leaps and bounds in service of organizations who are not patients, who are not the consumer. Um, so I guess this goes back to contracting and regulation. But uh, if you go to a hospital, your data is probably owned either by that hospital or by the EMR that the hospital uses. And they often have rights to resell it to others. And it's a little bit of a scary situation, actually. Yeah, I can't agree more. And in, in a line, data ownership and offloading <laughs> that problem is is just saying, I take the elephant out of one room and put it in your room, because you're going to get tons and tons of notifications about things that you don't even know about just because you're given the ownership and the permission rights to the user itself. And that's not, a, that's not the right way to solve the problem either. Can we yeah. use blockchain to solve it? OK. <laughs> yeah, blockchain is. <laughs> All right, that was a joke. Let's move the, over to questions from the audience. Uh, do we have a mic? Anyone questions? Well, that's coming up. I don't know if blockchain is the solution, but regulation very much okay. might be, right? Yeah. I, I, I don't know that industry will get there on its yeah, own. Yeah, that's true with the social side also, Facebooks mm -hmm. and others. Similar problems, not much of a difference. So. Question here. Yeah. Test. Oh, okay. Uh, is, is there a, like a near-term or ongoing discussion between regulatory bodies and the data, data science community over establishing uh, a CRISPR definition of why a sufficiently sophisticated data processing system is meaningfully different from a human being reading the data? Um, so is the question around how do you differentiate between AI reading the data versus a human reading the data? Yeah, at a certain point it seems that like a sufficiently sophisticated processing system, I, we have these regulations against some external human sort of reading this data, right? Uh, and the question is, at what point are we concerned about a sufficiently sophisticated data processing system having some characteristics that might approximate those characteristics that created those regulations in the first place? Got it. Actually, yeah, that's a very valid question because just the other day I was reading this news article that, you know, Alexa, the, uh, in order to actually refine the training of Alexa, humans have to actually hear what's going on and then they're privy to a lot of sensitive information. So anyone wants to take this question? I see some interesting conversation happening mm -hmm. in the journalistic community, right? There's investigative journalism, blogging. So there's thought work being done there. I don't know how far that's really penetrated into a regulatory world. Uh, I think, uh, I don't know, um, like a few days back, I saw two senators coming up with a bill which basically talks about something very, very similar. They basically worried about... So the, the interesting thing from my experience is that if you go tell a legal that there is a human involved in the training and stuff like that, they have less stress and then say, oh, my machine learning will take care of everything. So I think there is this... I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to do machine learning without labels to a great extent, which is created by humans. So there's a lot of involvement on both sides. Uh, I, I think... It's, it's going to be super hard to, uh, because the kind of problem solved in machine learning is so diverse that trying to, if someone tries to come up with a regulation, like how, how do they do the regulation itself is a very complex thing. It's a holy so grail of the difficulty a, is. Yeah, it's a holy grail of a Turing machine kind of question. I make a decision, I don't tell you if it's a human related decision or like a computer related decision. How are you going to distinguish? And that's the Turing test of what you're asking. 
Yeah, actually, I've got a specific example on this. So at a, a company I worked for before, we had a specific prediction task that our doctors, this is a medical company, were spending a ton of time on. They really didn't like doing the work, but they had to do it. It was a crucial process. So we built a, an engine that we called DocBot that would predict, you know, we took labeled training data, we just watched what the doctors did, classic human loop problem, and eventually got to the point where we had 84% accuracy on that task. And when I initially took back, that back to the team, they said, oh, this is a medical task, 84% accuracy, I don't know if we can live with that. So I went back to our chief medical officer and I said, okay, I've got some new tasks for you to code here, we just need some more training data. Uh, and I was lying to him. What I was actually doing is I took the first 500 tasks that he'd seen already, I shuffled them and showed them to him again. So he was just recoding the same data. And he went through and his agreement with himself was about 87%. And I took that back to the rest of the team. I said, look, computer 84, human 87, these are close. And everybody said, yep, yep, just turn it over to the bot. Yeah, a lot on a lighter note, there was a pigeon that was trained in an academic setting that was able to classify uh, uh, some of the medical imaging tasks that people in the machine learning community boast about in terms of achieving 99% accuracy. <laughs> so what we're doing is not AI, we're doing pigeon eye. Uh, yeah, and but, but, it's not artificial intelligence, we're just amplifying the intelligence of the user that is using uh, the technique. Uh, we are nowhere close to AI. Sure, but if, if you go back to the Turing test world, in a very limited domain, we can pass the Turing test, yeah. right? We are focusing on data sets that are too simple, um, and we are, uh, we are gaining um, you know, uh, ulterior confidence just by benchmarking our results on the same thing again and again. It's like a, it's like a hackathon on a very focused thing. You need a hackathon on the real world problems. So. <laughs> cool. So we're yeah. getting into a very lively discussion now. Unfortunately, we're at the end. Do we have other questions? One more here. Yeah, I think my question applies most to the split AI case, but uh, what I'm hearing is that you, in the interest of privacy, you're taking away access to the raw data from the data scientists, but still giving them a way to do their work. Uh, my understanding of a lot of machine learning pipelines is, you know, so much work goes into the data prep phase where people have to be doing data cleansing and there's a lot of assumptions about the data that need to be true first before you can eff make effective use of the data on the machine learning phase. So uh, what are your thoughts around, or, or what is the standard around, you know, I would want to almost write up a spec of, these are my expectations around the data, and you know, there are no nulls, or the nulls have been substituted with this. And in the split AI case, where different organizations are working with the data, you need some way to ag agree, I guess, like how the computer understand that. It, the data met my expectation before I'm gonna start doing any work with it. You've just said the word expectations like three or four times there. Um, let me put in a plug for an open source project that I'm deeply involved on called Great Expectations. It's focused on exactly that kind of problem. Awesome. Other questions? One more. Robert. Coming at this from the human side again, do you think there's room or reason for a Hippocratic Oath type of thing for privacy actions on the, the part of data scientists? <sighs> Or for yeah. for hip, for what exactly? Hippocratic oath, as in, uh -huh. you know, I will use the data the yeah. way it is intended for, right? So yeah, yeah it's basically yeah. it's interesting you talk about that because when I talked about the insider threat problem, this is exactly what we had to go through. So um, it's first thing is uh, kind of a lot of training and to understand like what they can see and not, and then everybody has to kind of sign an agreement and things like that. I, I think it's. It is, it's the way it is. It's basically um, like you're kind of putting your, you, it's basically like kind of regulation and um, saying that, okay, data scientists, you are basically aware of what you're trying to do. And this is like sensitive information and you're not really allowed to do anything beyond like what your work and stuff. So we had to kind of sign an agreement and saying that, okay, if accidentally, if you see something and stuff, you have to erase it from your head and things like that. It is, uh, I mean, uh, I say that's what I was heading into. Like regulation, this is like a really an open problem. Like how do you regulate these things? You know, you can get these signatures from data scientists saying that, you know, we wouldn't access do something which is uh, not we shouldn't be doing, and we know from uh, examples in Facebook and stuff these things happen. So how do you prevent this? Is still an open problem. So yeah. I yeah. think Rupa? the Hippocratic oath essentially just reminds you to avoid obvious mistakes. And that's pretty much what it does. And that's, but that's, that's an important point, right? So we did 
we did implement one of those in every system that we thought that people needed access to. So every time you log into the system, there'll be this UI that pops up, says, hey, remember, this is sensitive data. And then we even uh, think one of my colleagues has the interesting word saying, uh, are you comfortable talking about this with your mom? If not, then speak to your privacy uh, a privacy champion about whether this is a problem or not, whether you can share this information. So. That's awesome. Oh, yeah, 99% yeah, really cool. of data scientists are very nice. They don't do try to do things, but that one person, they were like, oh, I, this is curious. Let me try something. Yeah, I know. Well, yeah. It, to, to question about Hippocratic Oath, I, I think we ought to be moving there as a community, but I also don't believe that if we sat down together, all of us, and tried to write guidelines, I don't believe we're capable of doing that yet. I don't think we have like, enough consensus. But I think the thing that most teams can do is on their immediate team right now, you can write the equivalent of a Hippocratic Oath for your data team in your, in your context. Like, that's an exercise that basically everybody could do. And I think from a values perspective, most of us want to do that. I think if we do that, you know, and 500 companies all go through that exercise, then that'll give us enough kind of raw material to put together a bigger Hippocratic Oath for this community at large. Cool. That's my take.